For more on developments in Syria, we turn to NPR's Deborah Amos in Beirut. She's been covering the Syrian uprising and regularly speaks with members of the opposition inside Syria, as well as those who fled the country. Deborah, we just saw the scenes of terrible carnage outside two of the country's most feared and powerful intelligence services. Are suicide bombs of this kind an unusual event for Syria? Very unusual, in particular in one of the most protected pieces of real estate in the capital. This is the security service headquarters. There's two of them. And activists said to me today in conversation, some of them have, have actually served time there. There, there are jails there. Uh, and they say, you can't walk near that building. You can't drive a car near that building. So this is all very unusual that there would be two car bombs uh, uh, aimed at these security service centers in Damascus. So what's the implication that the attack was some sort of set up or uh, not genuinely a surprise to those inside the building? I think there's been a lot of skepticism both from the activists and also from regional analysts who say that the Syrians were very quick to blame this on al-Qaeda almost within 15 to, uh, minutes to a half an hour uh, after the events. Uh, Syrian TV said it was al-Qaeda. This does fit into the government narrative, and they have been saying for months that there is no popular uprising in the country. What this is is an attack by armed militants, uh, armed gangs, al-Qaeda, a foreign plot. And so today, this, this was their story. And this was the way that Syrian television played this story, uh, that this proves what we've been saying all along, that armed gangs are trying to attack Syria. Is al-Qaeda a plausible suspect? Has it been active inside the country? It has not. Uh, there, there have been jihadi groups in Syria. Let's remember, just a few years ago, this was the place that Washington said that jihadis were coming across the border to go into Iraq. Some of those people didn't leave. Some of those people are still in Syria. But al-Qaeda has not played a role inside Syria. Uh, and so that's why this was all so unusual to watch these two giant bombs go off today. And I think that's why there were so many questions outside the country. Washington certainly condemned uh, what it called a terrorist act and said that they would condemn any terrorist act. But they also called on the Arab League to do their job. Uh, monitors are in the country this week, or at least an advance team, to set up the monitors in the country. Uh, those monitors, or the, the advance team, were brought to the bomb site today by a high official from the foreign ministry who, who said to them, you see, this is what we've always said, that, that these are terrorists that are after Syria. And so it gives a bit of a bad start to this monitoring group to have this happen on a day of a giant bomb in Damascus. Along with that bombing in Damascus, uh, Damascus images and stories have begun to emerge about targeted villages in parts of Syria with tremendous loss of civilian life. Tell us more about those. Well, what we have is a reported massacre in a small village in northern Syria. Anywhere between 60 and 100 people apparently were killed there. The army surrounded the town and shelled the town, machine gunned uh, civilians inside the town, according to residents who survived and activists. And apparently this was a village that was harboring army defectors. And that seems to be what sparked uh, some of the most horrific uh, incidents in this 10-month-old uprising in northern Syria. We have reports of, of actually two massacres, one of a group of men who were defecting from the army. It appeared that they were on their way to the Turkish border, and they were surrounded. And then this village um, up near a town called Idlib. It's up in the mountainous part of Syria near the border. Uh, we are beginning to see videos uh, just got out last night. Uh, the electricity there has been off. The phone communications have been down. But we did see videos over the, over the last 24 hours of bodies laid out in mosques there, men who had name tags, really rough name tags. It looked like notebook paper. Uh, tapes, uh, cellophane taped onto their bodies. Um, and, and the cell phone cameras pans across, you know, dozens of, of bodies from this village. In, in some ways, Ray, this seems like we are at a new phase in the Syrian crisis. We've had some of the largest um, casualty totals over the past week. We have 
a reported al-Qaeda bomb in the middle of the capital. And now we have this advanced team uh, from the Arab League. It certainly has, has changed the dynamics of what is happening in Syria this week. Well, the advanced team has seen the damage in Damascus. Given the rules of engagement with the Arab League, what's the likelihood that they'll head up north to Kafr Oweid and Idlib? Well, that's a good question, and that is exactly what the advance team is in Damascus to do. Those details haven't been worked out, and there's some very serious questions. Who provides security? Is it the Syrian government or is it the Arab League? Who provides the cars? When is it uh, to be announced that these monitored teams will go somewhere? Do they have to announce to the Syrian government where they're going? That's what the team is there to sort out. Uh, can they go to the north? I think we have to wait and see. The first monitors are said to arrive over the weekend. Some of them are veteran human rights campaigners in the Middle East. And these people have made some stipulations about what they want to see happen so that this monitoring team stays tra transparent, uh, is able to see for itself what's going on on the ground. NPR's Deborah Amos in Beirut. Deb, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ray.